What a crowd. Great to be here in uh, sunny Copenhagen. And you even have a, you know, speaking of Greenfield, I listened to uh, Alan's talk earlier, Greenfield and Brownfield. Uh, Sweden is still quite brown. We don't have green grass yet. Uh, so it's, it's nice to be here for many reasons. Uh, my name is Johan Beck. I've been with Infinera for over 20 years. I started my career in uh, hand handling wafer, Indian phosphide wafers back in our clean room in California. And now I handle customers and uh, these types of dialogues. So quite different. We're speaking to the vertical integration. Let's see around here if this works. So a little bit about Infinera. Uh, we're all about dense wavelength division multiplexing and optical transport. So. Uh, addressing use cases from subsea cables, putting a lot of capacity you know, from, from the US to Europe, for example, long haul metro um, and into the access. We're about 3,000 employees worldwide, very vertically integrated. Uh, if you look at uh, the technologies uh, in our products, they're like the underlying technology uh, is, is based on photonic integrated circuits, something we pioneered 20 years ago. Uh, that's how Infinera was founded. Uh, indium phosphide. Nobody thought we could do it. Here we are 20 years later, and in, photonic integration is, is a key aspect of all um, optical transmission to date. Uh, we build our own coherent ASICs. I'll talk a little bit about coherent today. Uh, it's really just doing what people in microwave have been doing for you know, 35 years. It's just that optics, everything is much, much faster, about 10,000 higher symbol rates. Uh, but it's something we're doing. Uh, we do our own packaging, and we build our own systems that we sell to, to um, you know, ICPs and uh, service providers and ISPs uh, globally and wrap services around it. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of trends. The first one is optical transmission is really going coherent. We saw that about, was it 2010 or so, the first coherent transceivers came out on the market uh, for long haul purely. And the whole idea there with coherent is that you could get a lot more capacity on a single fiber. So at the time, we were selling at Infinera 160 times 10 gig, so 1.6 terabits on a fiber pair. Uh, with Coherent today, the evolution we've had, we're up to, I don't know, 30, 50, 80 terabits on a fiber pair. So it's really been crazy, the type of evolution over the past decade. Uh, so starting in long haul, then it went into metro networks, so smaller, sm smaller networks, not... not uh, you know, tens of terabits in scale. Um, and now what we're seeing is a trend where coherent, uh, especially with XR optics, is a new technology we're productizing this year. And we're looking at how coherent can drive further out in the networks into the access. Uh, and of course, this is, this is driven by um, increase in traffic everywhere. Um, and and uh, coherent is like the next step once you run out of steam with on-off keyed solutions. And the, the, the challenge is to make things simple, cheap, because in the access, things need to be simple and cheap, right? And large volumes. So uh, just uh, I wanted to show in a slide here what coherent transmission does. So starting from the left, this is about you know, 2015 or, or so. Uh, the first 200 gig transceivers came on the market. Uh, they could do 100 or 200 gig on a fiber pair, go up to maybe 1,400 kilometers in the highest rate mode, 200 gig. And then there's just been a succession of new generations uh, fueled by two things. Uh, one is um, better ASIC technology, lower line, uh, line widths on, on, on the, in the DSPs, meaning you can do more and more fancy processing in, in, in the same power envelope. Um, and the second thing is just utilizing higher and higher uh, order modulation formats. And that's possible by better forward error correction and a lot of complex things I won't go into here. So if you look today at the latest and greatest 800 gig technology that's on the market, um, we can drive 800 gig wavelengths over 1,000 kilometers in, 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 a, in real networks. We, we do that today. We, those, uh, that, that, those products are, are available. Um, but what, so you may wonder, you know, coherent, why, why would anyone want a coherent transponder, right? Because these days it's a lot about pluggables. And yes, that's true. Uh, but there's one big difference between uh, an optical um, transponder, that's like a standalone optical transport uh, device, and a pluggable where, that you can literally stick into almost anything needing, even your toaster, hopefully one day. Uh, and, and that's 
and that's that the, uh, the latest transponders, they're running 800 gig per wavelength because they're really like Rolls Royces or, I don't know, Ferraris. Uh, no limits on, it's all about performance. Uh, pluggables have to fit in, in, a, in a small space and fit within a certain power envelope. Uh, so the latest pluggables are running 400 gig per wavelength. So what, what you're giving up is really two things. You're giving up on reach, how far you can go without regenerating, and you're giving up on, on uh, uh, cost per bit in some cases, right? Um, and how much capacity you can get on a single fiber. The other um, trend that's happening is, you know, wh wherever you look in telecoms um, or datacom, like open networking is here, even at the, you know, the basement uh, which, which, uh, of, of, of telecoms, which is uh, DWDM. So starting from the bottom, we have a line system that's basically uh, amplifiers to make sure that um, you have the right power level coming in, coming into each receiver, so you can terminate the traffic. Uh, and it's also multiplexers, you can call it, or ways to route traffic and also uh, separate it and into multiple um, interfaces. And those line systems today, it's table stakes to sell an open line system that can carry traffic from multiple different types of transceivers and transponders. And the transport layer, which is layer one, uh, you have an optical engine, so that's that's some type of optics, optical function to convert bits into to, uh, to photons, electrons to photons, uh, and a DSP. And those are come in two forms. The first one is pluggable. So here's an example of what that may look like, QSFP DD. Uh, and the other one is embedded, which is also a module. It's just, it, you can't just plug it into something. It's bigger and it sits on a board. It uses a lot more power. And there are different types of transport devices, right, that you can buy if you want to um, go far or have a demarcation. But increasingly, what's happening is also pluggable optics. You can stick, stick them directly in routers and switches. And, you know, it's not just routers and switches. With XR optics, we're looking at access applications and, and for example, the ORAN uh, ecosystem. So, so um, uh, radio. Uh, vendors, right? The radio unit could have a coherent interface down the line for next generation frontal uh, traffic to run. It could be um, uh, virtual DUs. Uh, you have a you have a uh, like an x86 server stack with a, some type of smart NIC that now come with QSF PDD cages. You could put a coherent interface right there and build networks in a fundamentally very different way. Um, and at Infinera, right? We've been building very like closed systems historically. So when I started as a, you know, I think of myself as young still, but I realize I'm not because when I started in Finera, we were productizing, which was like this fantastic new product. We were so proud, 2004, it was, looked like a fridge. It was 400 gig DWM capacity, had built-in OTN switching, and it sold like hotcakes. I think 2007 to 2008, 10 gig long haul wavelengths, we had majority market share globally, okay? So, wonderful product, but these days, 400 gig of capacity is this size, right? So it's gone from something like this to something like this. And, and we've gone from selling something quite um, closed, so monolithic system that you could use, you know, you bought a chassis, it did everything, and you could hook it up into something, to, to, to living in this open world where um, this, this XR optic, uh, it's our first pluggable optic. Um, we will keep making transponders and embedded optics. Um, we're very successful with our CHM6 for, for subsea. Uh, but unless you need you know, 800 gig on a wavelength or 30 terabits across, across um, um, a, sub, a long haul network or, or a subsea cable, uh, there's problem, there may be places in your, in your network for, for uh, coherent pluggables, like XR or ZR Plus. So uh, XR Optics, we're utilizing a feature called Nyquist subcarriers. Um, and if you're familiar with radio technology, this, isn't, this isn't, isn't really rocket science. What we're doing is we take one laser um, and we, um, instead of having one large carrier, we split into many smaller carriers. So this is done in you know, 5G new radio uh, RANs, for example but we just do it at, uh, at a much, much higher rate. So 192 terahertz is 
roughly the middle of the C-band. So it takes a lot of DSP power to do this. Uh, we do it uh, to extend reach in uh, sub-C and long-haul applications. But with XR optics, we're doing something different. So each of these sub-carriers um, is, is, is framed independently. So you can run, like, we have 16 sub-carriers in this 400 gig DD. Each one can carry 25 gig of traffic, That's like a 25 gig E. Uh, and they, they're really like virtual wavelengths. You have one transceiver, but you can go to 16 different endpoints. So uh, a different way you can call this is like, uh, it's next generation coherent PON, passive optical networking. So while the rest of the world is struggling on how to get beyond 25 gig PON or 50 gig PON, we have 200 gig PON here today in my hand. And that, that's one use case we're talking. I'll talk more about that shortly. All done by these subcarriers. So, so um, if you have a long haul system, uh, this is an example from using, using our uh, transponders with Nyquist subcarriers. You get this spectrum of wavelengths that's really, really filled of traffic, right? So we've done 30 terabits from, from on this Marea cable and deployed 29. And that's, that's really, really good. Very, very competitive, high spectral efficiency, and allows an operator to use, um, use that fiber sub-C fiber much, much more efficiently. I don't know what it costs to lay a sub-C cable, but it's probably, I don't know, it's at least 100 million US dollars. Uh, but even if you want to go from here, to Cop from here in Copenhagen up to, um, up to Stockholm, you know, buying a, a fiber pair, an IRU, may cost a million euros. So if you make that investment, you may want to consider, it, it depends, right, on what type of traffic you need to run. But transponders have their place because fibers are expensive. So with, now I'll get into this point-to-multipoint -point function of, of, of the XR optic that's enabled by these subcarriers. So in any aggregation network, um, and that could be a, could be a metro network or, or a access network, basically where you have a lot of smaller sites on the left there, uh, and you take traffic from those smaller sites into a larger core site. Uh, when you use traditional point-to-point -point optical transceivers, if you have, you know, 10, smaller sites, and you need to take traffic from 10 smaller sites into a large site, you need 10 small transceivers. So you end up with 20 transceivers. With XR, we can really collapse that and have one large transceiver at the hub talking to those 10 smaller transceivers at the edge locations. And this can save a lot of money. So we can reduce the amount of transceivers. We can eliminate, in some cases, intermediate uh, aggregation devices. So if you have you know, it could be a switch, Max Bonder could even be a, uh, if you have a router that's basically not anchoring services, but aggregating a lot of low speed interfaces to high speed inter interfaces. You can improve the router efficiency by, uh, for example, um, using a 400 gig, gigabit ethernet port and talk to many smaller devices. So many, you could have a bunch of 100 gig ethernet ports in your access sites talking to a single 400 gig e-port in your, in your hub site. So you can use your equipment more, more efficiently and save a lot of money that way. So um, I'll bring up one example here from, yeah, before the example. Um, after this, we'll have a speaker from Smart Optics at Infinera. We think this is a very smart optic because it does so many different things. Uh, it can work in point to point. Uh, you can also use this as a, as a breakout cable. So, um, like I talked about this 400 gig router port, right? You can configure that to 400 gig Emax, right? Um, this all of a sudden becomes not a two kilometer breakout plug. It's a thousand kilometers if you build the right line system. So you can go from a single 400 gig port out into four different sites. Um, that can be up to a thousand kilometers away, but you know, just a couple of hundred is perfect. We, we also have this flexible point to multipoint mode where, where we can do some switching inside the plug, uh, VLAN switching to, to reach up to 16 different endpoints and, and, and kind of reassign traffic in a very dynamic fashion is very important in, in access use cases. Um, and using this point to multipoint function, you can reduce the amount of transceivers. We've done a lot of case studies with, with uh, some public with, with uh, operators worldwide for the last two, three years. Um, you get flexibility. We can deploy on single fiber, for example. Um, we, we can uh, deploy in different uh, types of 
um, infrastructures, different channel plans, etc., and, and move capacity around even asymmetrically, so you have higher downlink and uplink speeds. So very, very flexible and future-proof. Um, we can address all the regular, usual ZR, ZR plus um, uh, use cases, unamplified, amplified, or extended reach links, uh, but also a lot of new ones with a point-to-multipoint function, right? We have um, um, access applications and metro aggregation. Uh, I'll talk a couple of minutes about this case we, study we did with, with uh, BT. We took their nationwide footprint a couple of years ago, looked at about a thousand of their uh, central offices where they have traffic on the order of, I don't know, 20, 30 gig that they need to take into core sites. Um, and, how, with, with, and the traffic flow is really, it's really aggregation, right? Hub and spoke. Um, and we showed really significant savings, over 70% compare, using XR optics for point to multi point compared to uh, um, traditional uh, layer one, layer zero solution. Uh, we're also looking at access applications, as I mentioned earlier. So, for example, 5G front hall. Um, there are, for example, tower owners who, um, like we did a trial with American Tower last year that we um, did a press release on, where, where we tested to run XR to multiple cell sites. In American Tower, they own quarter million cell sites worldwide, and, and they see their tenants needing to transport a lot of capacity back to central hub facilities where they have the DUs. Uh, so being able to leverage um, fiber in the ground, pawn infrastructure to deliver 5G front hall services is really appetizing. Could also be, you know, services, ISPs may be interested in delivering more capacity over existing fiber route to, to um, uh, enterprises. So lots of activity there. Happy to talk in the break more. Um, I guess I missed those animations. All right, so you may wonder, so XR, is this only Infinero who's going to be pushing this or selling this? Is it a bespoke technology that nobody else will offer? And, the, 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 you know, as I said earlier, Infinera, our strategy now is to be open. Uh, so we're, we created a, um, an MSA working group last year uh, together with BT, Verizon, Lumen, Windstream, and, and Liberty Global. Uh, we've added some more members since then, Telefonica, Zeo, Crown Castle, Colt, AT&T. So we have a, like a wide group of different operators uh, with interest in different use cases from the core all the way out to the access. Uh, we will, there's, a, there's a pipeline of uh, other network equipment manufacturers about to join. So this won't just be operator-led. Uh, there will also be others joining. And the goal really here is to create an ecosystem, uh, which is, we, in our view, very, very important to create differentiated you know, overall solutions for you as a customer, where each um, vendor uh, contributes what they're strong at. Right. So takeaways. Uh, point to multipoint could be a different way of building networks can save on the amount of transceivers, the amount of router ports, can use higher speed ports to aggregate traffic from many uh, endpoints, uh, reduce capex and opex. You run this in many, many modes, right? So point to point, maybe 400 gig to 400 gig uh, uh, router, core router interconnect, um, out to the access where you do 5G front hall from many cell towers into a single um, edge compute facility. Um, so, I think that was my last slide. If you have any more questions, please come to the booth. I'm, I'll be over in the iTechra booth with this thing and a little photonic integrated circuit you could take a look at. So thank you very much for your attention and open to questions here if you have any. Thank you, thank you Johan. So I know one person who has a question. Okay. <laughs> When is lunch? Was that your question? <laughs> <laughs> now you've got to sit through someone else first, I'm afraid. <laughs> Any questions from anyone else? None, really. You just bought all the that, month? didn't you? <laughs> 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 all right, I'll be outside oh, later. So. Yeah. So uh, I hope I w oh yeah Peter uh, Krubel from uh, Progressive I hope I will not embarrass myself by asking this question, but.
but what exactly does coherent mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so coherent means like old school light communication, right? You turn, you take, you take a light source like a laser and you turn it on and off. That's called intensity modulation, on-off keying. And, and, and if the light is on, it, it's a one or a zero. Uh, with coherent technology, you start playing with not only the intensity of the light, which could be multiple levels, but you also modulate the, uh, uh, the phase. So you could, it's similar to, yeah, hey, actually someone at Infinera knows this. Um, <laughs> so you know like AM and FM radio. Um, FM isn't quite phase modulation. Um, it, like phase modulation is like a digital version of, of uh, FM, but you can view it as AM and FM radio combined. Instead of just having things on and off, there's a lot more sophistication going on. So you can get every time, you know, every time you turn that light on and off with, with the old school uh, transceiver, um, that's called the symbol rate, right? You can do that, for example, you know, 50 million times per second or so. Every time you have one of those symbols with coherent, you can send a lot more bits. So, so it's a more efficient way of uh, getting information across the fiber. And it's not, you know, th this is coherent. Is, it's been done in microwave for years. Um, the interesting thing now is that there's actually something called Shannon's Limit, where a guy called Claude Shannon at Bell Labs, um, I think in the, I don't know, 40s or 50s or so, he wrote something on a napkin almost like, here's the limit of how much capacity you can um, send across a given channel with, under a certain amount of noise. And the radio guys, I think they've been there for years. Uh, and uh, at Optics, with the latest embedded Optics, the sub for sub C, that's it. There won't be many, uh, you can't get more information across that. So it's, it's an interesting time to be in Optics. And, Actually, very happy to be here. Most of you are not in optics, so happy to have your attention for such a long time. Good question. There's nothing like a, there's, there are no bad questions. Just because you don't know doesn't mean that everybody else knows. So, any more good questions? Last call. You're not going to get your lunch any quicker if you don't have questions. <laughs> Just saying. We have. <laughs> Hi, my name is <coughs> Harm Derkman. Um, what is the optical power budget of your XR optics? What's the output power and the input power requirements? Yeah, so uh, output power, we do zero dBm, uh, whether it's QSFP, DD, or um, CFP2, which are the two form factors we're bringing to market this year. Uh, there are also some other optical specs that, that we're quite competitive at. Uh, to make it easier to work in a brownfield environment. Now I got to say brownfield again. Um, and on the input, like what we're targeting as, as a spec, general requirement for ponds is to go 30 dB. So, so that's the spec we're targeting for, for, uh, for pond applications. Uh, for for um, like more like a metro application, it's, it's less relevant because the line system will make sure you get enough power to, uh, to, to, to terminate the signal. Any more questions? We like good questions. Oh. Um, so I'm Tom uh, from Cloudflare. I was wondering if there's any work being done in getting closer channels when you're looking at the available frequency space that you can use on optics, because I think currently the separation is 100 gigahertz. Is there anything like kind of being done there to get that even closer and closer together to get more capacity out of a fiber? Yeah, so that's been an evolution for a long time. I showed that spectrum. You can see things are very, very tight. Uh, I'll put it two ways. So um, everyone's trying to get the channels closer together, and, and it's been done with something called flex grid, where you have these, uh, you know, the WSSs, for example, so you can support down to 37 and a half gig spacing. Uh, with, with these Nyquist subcarriers that I talked about, we have actually these 25 gig independent channels. 
and this channel spacing is less than 100 megahertz. So there's insanely tightly spaced, and there are some control loops to make sure that things work, not just downstream, but, but, but upstream. Uh, then if you have two of these sitting next to each other, um, they still have to be, you know, I, I don't know, six, eight gigahertz apart. But if you want to route them to different locations, you're limited by the WSS technology or optical filtering technology, which is much coarser in, in comparison, like, I don't know, 10, 15 gigahertz. So, yeah, it's all about, especially on subsea, it's all about how much do you get, can you get into the link. But in metro and access, it's less critical. All right, so it's time for Kent, I think, or? Oh, another? Mo another one, <laughs> yeah. Hi, Steve Jones from Huber and Sooner. Uh, just to answer the question earlier about... Um, closer. Just to answer the question, yeah, you can get 50 gigahertz spaced um, DWDM. You typically use them for 80 channel muxes. They're available today. Most people provide 50 gigahertz spaced DWDM across 80 channel muxes. Yeah, that's right. Good. Any, oh, and another one? <laughs> I shall project. Uh, so, uh, Matthias from Cisco again. I just wanted to say, uh, I looked it up. Uh, Mathematical Theory of Information by Shannon was pu published in 1949. And what did I say? I said 40s or 50s. 40s or 50s. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> and actually, if anyone's curious, it's a fantastic read. Yeah. Maths is not um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> people, please do use the mic because we have a lot of people watching, and if you don't use the mic, they don't get to join in all the good bits. So, any other more comments or questions or? Great. Well, thank all right, you very thank much. Thank you all. <laughs> and over to. Uh,